structures and functional differences. between upper limb and lower limbs. Okay. So with this rotation of the limb buds, the entire upper limb, the anterior compartment of arm, forearm and palm, they are all flexors. So all these muscles here, they are all flexors. Similar now at the back, the entire, you know, back, uh, back of upper limb, you know, back of arm, back of forearm, dorsum of hand, all of them are extensor compartments. Got it? Similarly, in the case of lower limbs, now see the reverse thing happening with the rotation of the buds. Now, the front of the entire lower limb, front of thigh, front of leg, dorsum of foot, they're all extensors, same as back of upper limb. Now, back of lower limb, back of thigh, back of leg, sole, they're all flexors, same as front of upper limbs. So, the compartments can also be changed by 180 degrees. Look, look here, like. Cubital fossa is homologous to popliteal fossa, but they are 180 degree fossa. Got it? So, and because the compartments are getting changed now, the functions, the functions of you know flexion and extension that also will be changed. So keep focusing now. Bones, I have already told you the homology. But remember one thing: your shoulder girdle and the pelvic girdle, they are fixed, they're not going to get twisted. Only the distal portion of the limb buds arising from these girdles, they will get twisted. So, the front of arm, you know, the muscles here in the front of arm, this compartment is the flexor compartment. And here in the, you know, arm is comparable to the front of thigh. And the front of thigh, the muscles, we all will be extensors. All the muscles here will be extensive. Front of forearm, the muscles here are all the flexor muscles, which will cause flexion at the joint distal to that. Similarly, now front of forearm, if you compare the front of leg, this will be the extensive compartment. Got it? Palm, the muscles here, they are all causing flexion. Flexion of the joints ahead, MP joint, IP joint, and here on the anterior and you know muscles on the foot, dorsum of foot, they are again extensors of the toes, extensor digitorum brevis, extensor hallus and brevis. Now look here, the back of arm, the muscles here in the back of arm, this this is called the extensor compartment. This is homologous to this. This is homologous to this the rotation okay? so back of thigh is homologous to the front of arm so this compartment will be flexor compartment now back of leg is homologous to the front of forearm so this will be flexor compartment and the palm is same as sole so in the sole the muscles will all be flexors they all be causing flexion of the joints ahead right the toes. 
So you guys now look here. The front of leg is homologous. The back front of lower limb is homologous to the back of upper limb. So back of forearm is extension compartment, and this is same as front of leg. Dorsum of foot is same as dorsum of hand. They are extensors. So you got to see that all the compartments have. They have got 180 degree opposite. One thing. Now think about the actions. Normally flexion, flexion is like forward bending of these joints. They, you know, uh, maybe shoulder. Like let's say the shoulder joint. Sh you know, the shoulder joint forward flexion is like. Before that, let me tell you then another gross thing that the movements of the joint they will also be 180 degree opposite except. At the hip and shoulder. Remember, this is very important. You must be thinking like all the muscles here in the front of upper limb they are flexors. So all the movements like this is flexion of shoulder joint, this is flexion of elbow joint, this is flexion of the wrist joint. Okay? So movement of all the joints, the forward bending, they are flexors, flexion. This is all action in the upper limb is flexion. In the lower limb, except this, except this, you know hip joint this forward line because front of upper limb is same as back of lower limb so in the back of lower limb like you know backward movement of this hip joint is extension but there will be flexion at the knee backward you know decrease in this hand direction is flexion behind then you know plantar flexion of the ankle joint is again flexion let me again hold on this point. Movement to the joints, normally you must have heard about plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So you, you've been using this word of flexion both ways. Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Which actually is flexion and which is extension. So remember that in the dorsum of foot, that's the tendons of the extensor compartment, the leg they are going. So dorsiflexion is Better word, the better word for that is extension of the angle. Remember, dorsiflexion is same as extension of the angle joint. And you know, the back of leg, the flexors, flexor part of the leg, those tendons move on back into the sole behind the angle. So what happens behind the medial malleolus? So what happens? Plantar flexion is actually flexion. So remember that dorsiflexion at the ankle is extension. Plantar flexion is flexion. So, this will cause flexion here. So, you see, yeah, Lau is telling that you know all these joints in the upper limb, anterior movement is flexion. In the lower limb, they, they are causing flexion behind, except at the hip joint. Now, see the back of upper limb compared to the front of the lower limbs. In the upper limbs, all the movements going behind, like this is extension at shoulder. This is extension at elbow. This is extension at the wrist. But that's comparable to the front of the leg. So in the front of the leg, movements in front, like you know, this is extension of the ankle. This is, I told you, that's just now dorsiflexion is actually extension of the ankle. Forward flexion, forward movement. But at the hip, the terminology is same as shoulder. Forward bending is flexion. Backward bending is extension. So the terminology of movements at shoulder and hip remain the same. Otherwise, in case of anteroposterior plate, the terminology of movements becomes changed by 180 degrees in case of knee and ankle, elbow and wrist. Rather, all the joints, except at the shoulder and hip. What will be the reason why, like you know, this thing is not the terminology of movements at the hip and shoulder is same? Because there should be like you know with this rotation. But remember, because hip girdle, this is pelvic girdle and the shoulder girdle, they are fixed. They're fixed. They're not going to be rotated like twisted. So all the twisting of the upper and lower limbs, buds, they are happening at the distal portion. You know that diagram, the starfish right embryo. The distal portion of the limb buds they'll get rotated. But the you know, shoulder and pelvic girdle, they are still fixed. So hip joint. Shoulder joint. Although the compartments are reversed, right? front of thigh, 
is extensor front of arm is flexor back of thigh is flexor back of arm is extensor but still the terminology of movement at shoulder and hip is same the reason is these joints are fixed and another reason <coughs> Let me tell you, if I'm comparing, I should start comparing from the tetrapods, the quadrupeds. They are core like animals, right? And I told you in my previous lecture, with embryo, you know, developmentally, both the limbs were actually centuries and centuries and ages back. The purpose of upper limb and lower limb was to maintain your posture and to maintain your weight against the gravity and for locomotion and balance. So if you come, if you see the real purpose from the humans have evolved from the quadrupeds, the purpose was when you are so like imagine a dog sitting on the floor. So when dog lifts up to stand against the gravity, he actually has to extend, uh, you know, cause extension at all the joints in this fore limb and in the hind limb. That will help to elevate his body against the gravity. So the purpose of shoulder and hip again was to elevate the body against the gravity, right? So here if you imagine, extension was required at both these joints. Now if a person stands up erect, like in humans, the, the, you know, the purpose of the you know, structural purpose is still the same, but because we are not using swallow motion for, you know, you know, uh, for standing in, you know, on four foot. So what happens is, the purpose of these joints is still the same that you uh, these limbs were primarily designed to help you in locomotion but now with the evolution your upper limbs have been evolved for prehension and grasping and manipulative tools so that was all like a comparison now about uh, the other features let's talk about the skin the skin there's also a difference in the skin let me tell you again this is again from the evolutionary point as we all evolved from the quadrupeds they were four legged animals so the portion of the body of a four legged animal that is exposed to the atmosphere that is the terminology of dorsal and ventral is like since there we now call it an anterior and posterior because we're standing erect but actually, it is calling as ventral, and this is the dorsal. This terminology is right in the quadrupeds. So the portion of this quadruped that is exposed on the dorsum towards the sun, towards the you know the sky, towards the dust, pollen, temperature, and even the dog sleeps or the animal sleeps on the floor or rubs his body against different you know structures and plants and all. So the dorsum, the skin on the dorsum is thick and more hairy even in us while the skin on the ventral portion of the trunk as well as in the limbs because that was primarily you know, ventral the like ventral world is from the quadruped so ventral portion of the body he was facing towards the ground so the skin on the ventral surface is thin comparatively thin and less hairy but the ventral portion was to let to escape the heat right temperature regulation so you know that every person when every person and even the animal like converges his body in case of cold to prevent the heat loss on the ventral side so the skin here on the ventral side is thin and more vascular and less hairy same thing happens in case of the limbs now in the limbs because this is derived from the ventral surface of the four limbs in quadrupeds now this ventral surface, you know, the flexor surface, the anterior surface is thin and less hairy compared to the skin on the back which is more hairy, more thick. Same in case of the lower limbs, now anterior compartment, the legs is more hairy, more thick. The back, which is same as the front of upper limbs, the back of lower limbs is less hairy, less thick. And the middle side, thigh, remember that's the uh, best side for skin donation, the skin grafting, the autograft that's taken is basically from the meal side of the thigh which is like a you know a big area which is uh, you know smooth or you can say is less of hair so for enough so the purpose of hair was again on the dorsal side 
so that was about the skin now muscles of course the muscles and developmentally they will get changed to the different different compartments according to the rotation of the limb buds now about the blood supply a gladian artery which continues as axillary artery which continues as brachial artery right where this terminology is getting changed here remember that after crossing the outer part of the first rib this is subclavian subclavian artery now it will be called axillary artery and where will the name get changed again after crossing the lower border of this muscle here which muscle is this so axillary artery gets its new name now called as brachial artery after crossing the lower border of this muscle called teres major now brachial artery divides into two terminal branches one of them is a minor terminal division one is a major terminal division remember whenever an artery terminally divides into two branches they are not of equal caliber one of them will be a miniature branch and the other will be a major continuation so brachial artery which is the major continuation of brachial artery remember ulnar artery is the major continuation while the radial artery is a minor plate of brachial artery which is superficial and ulnar artery is a deeper artery now this ulnar artery in the forearm it gives the largest branch the largest branch of ulnar artery in the forearm is common interosseous artery so this is common interosseous artery common interosseous artery at the upper part of the interosseous membrane so one again splits into an anterior and posterior interosseous artery like this again because it's terminally divided into branches one of them will be the major continuation of common interosseous and other will be minor so which will be the minor division remember that posterior interosseous artery is a minor division of common interosseous artery and anterior interosseous artery is the major continuation of the common interosseous now this anterior interosseous artery will descend down and remember there is this interosseous membrane here this is interosseous membrane here between radius and ulna so this anterior interosseous artery will now perforate the interosseous membrane at its junction between upper two third and lower one third and this artery will now reach and then behind in the posterior and extensor compartment what about this artery the posterior interosseous artery as it was running down in the back of forearm remember because it's a minor division of common interosseous it will not be sufficient for itself to supply the entire back of forearm so this anterior interosseous artery it perforates the interosseous membrane at the junction of upper two third and lower one third and reaches into the back of forearm and there it reinforces the posterior interosseous artery so which artery passes below the extensor retina pulmonary in the fourth space that will be anterior interosseous artery that runs below the extensor retina pulmonary got it okay so remember all these things they will be repeated here in the lower limbs now ulnar artery it continues below this flexor carpi ulnaris flexor digitum superficialis and will now reach into the palm passing below the volar carpal ligament and that canal is guens canal by the way guens canal ulnar artery ulnar nerve both are contents of guens canal which is medial which is lateral remember n for nerve n for nearer to pc form so nerve is medial artery is lateral in the guens canal so in the palm now there is this formation of this superficial palmar arch this is superficial palmar arch superficial palmar arch remember is a continuation of ulnar arch having on 
gone through this, now let's focus on here in this, in this compartment. Now in the leg, this artery here descends down like this and as it goes like this. So keep telling me now, what is this structure? Of course, you're seeing one ligament. So this artery is external iliac artery, right? External iliac artery will be called femoral artery, right? This is called femoral artery. After crossing to this point here, this point here is what is this point here? Mid inguinal point or mid point of inguinal ligament? This is mid inguinal point, right? Passing to the lateral compartment of the femoral sheath. Now femoral artery runs downwards, forward, and leads to the needle side to get to come in. Initially, it's a content of this, you know, triangle, the femoral triangle, then the adductor canal, right? So this you can imagine is the femoral triangle. This is the hunter's canal, right? Adductor canal. Now, when this comes out, there is an opening here also. The femoral artery when it emerges out of this opening called what is this opening called? This is called hiatus magnus, which is the opening of adductor canal. Now the name of this artery will change and it will be called now popliteal artery. Got it? Now, popliteal artery will of course be running into the back because it has twisted like this. Right? So, it will reach into the popliteal fossa. Now, in the popliteal fossa, again here will be interosseous membrane. Remember, now keep comparing the homology. Here. So, posterior popliteal artery, when it reaches to the above, upper part of this interosseous membrane, or exactly speaking, where does popliteal artery terminally divide into its two branches? One is posterior tibial, another is anterior tibial artery. So, which will be the minor division of popliteal artery? Which will be the major continuation of popliteal artery? This you can answer from the homology I told you. So, the main continuation of the ulnar artery was at the front of forearm. That was anterior interosseous artery. Posterior interosseous is a minor branch. Now think about the leg. The main continuation of popliteal artery will be running in the back of leg or in the front of leg. So front of forearm is homologous to the back of leg. So there is a bulky compartment, more of requirement of blood. So remember, posterior tibial artery is the continuation. Posterior tibial artery it will divide like this. So posterior tibial artery is the main continuation of this is posterior tibial artery, which is the main continuation of popliteal artery. And anterior tibial artery is a minor branch, which is running in the front of leg, which is an extensor compartment, same as back of forearm. Now think about in the back of forearm, what about this posterior interosseous artery? It I told you was supplying only the upper two-third of the back of forearm. In the lower one-third, what was happening? The anterior interosseous was perforating and reaching to the back of forearm to reinforce the popliteal post artery. Same thing will happen here now. But remember now, the front of arm, if you compare the bulk of tissue, the muscles in the front of forearm and back of leg, back of leg you find is much more bulkier compartment. So what happens is this posterior tibial artery in the back of leg is not sufficient alone to supply the entire back of leg. What happens is that this posterior tibial artery in the back of leg gives its longest and the largest branch and that is peroneal artery, fibular artery. So in the back of the leg, this posterior tibial artery gives us another branch and that branch is called fibular, fibular or peroneal artery. Now this instead of like, you know, if you are comparing the homology, it was anterior interosseous artery reaching the back of forearm. Here it should be posterior interosseous artery that should perforate the interosseous membrane and reach into the front of leg. But it's not happening, so rather it's the peroneal artery. This peroneal artery will perforate, this peroneal artery.
and 3 will perforate the interosseous membrane this peroneal artery will perforate and will now enter into the front of leg after perforating the interosseous membrane in the lower one third upper two third junction comparable right you comparing this now this anterior interosseous artery of course when uh, it doesn't mean the entire anterior interosseous which is while it perforates the interosseous membrane and reaches to the back what about the blood supply in the lower one third of the front of the fora there is still a minor division of anterior interosseous artery which continues in the lower one third of the front of the fora that artery some authors call it as median artery they say that like you have a radial artery radial now ulnar artery ulnar now why median now should left be left alone so the anterior interosseous artery in the lower one third of the front of fora is called median artery but the inter artery itself reaches to the back of fora and it's called it passes below the extensor adenal bluff so remember this median artery here in the lower one third participates in the cruciate anastomosis this is cruciate anastomosis i'll tell you later on so if you compare this thing now now about the anterior tibial artery anterior tibial artery is homologous to posterior interosseous artery so anterior tibial artery will supply the blood mainly in the upper two third of the leg right the muscles of the front of leg this is anterior tibial artery although it will continue now passing below the extensor retinaculum and will now be called as dorsalis pedis artery so don't get confused dorsalis pedis artery is a continuation of anterior tibial artery okay now about the posterior tibial artery the posterior tibial artery as i said we were comparing posterior tibial to ulnar artery post ulnar artery was the major continuation of the brachial artery in the front of fora so popliteal artery gives its major continuation that is posterior tibial artery which is like the main artery in the back of leg ulnar artery was crossing the wrist and forming the superficial palmar arch which is the main blood supply of the palm now here also this posterior tibial artery will wind behind the medial malleolus exiting through the flexor retinaculum and will reach into the sole so remember that this posterior tibial artery this posterior tibial artery actually reaches into the sole to form this plantar arterial arch so homology is clear now the superficial palmar arch is continuation of ulnar artery the plantar arterial arch which is right you know which is found between the third and the fourth layer of the sole so that plantar arterial arch is a continuation of posterior tibial artery and that is through you know the lateral or medial plantar artery you know this posterior tibial artery it divides into medial and lateral plantar artery of the sole so the later again well so i was telling whenever an artery divides terminally it divides to two major and minor you know one major and a minor division so posterior tibial artery divides below the flexor retinaculum into two divisions medial plantar artery and lateral plantar artery which is the major continuation lateral plantar artery medial plantar artery the minor division so the lateral part plantar artery running between first and second layer right laterally crosses the second layer crosses the third layer and then from lateral to medial runs between third and fourth layer to form the plantar arterial arch so plantar arterial arch is same as superficial palmar arch superficial palmar arch is continuation of ulnar artery plantar arterial arch is a continuation of lateral plantar artery which actually is a continuation of posterior tibial artery got it now same in case of nerves there is less of space also here i am not going to draw it here I will just revise it for you. Let's talk about the palm and sole. Right here, also you have is a deep plant, you know, palmar arch. The deep palmar arch is a continuation of radial arch. <coughs> But in the sole, you don't have like something as you know the uh, you know this is the superficial and deep arch. You have 
two arches here but in the soul what is there there is a deep you know there is a plantar arterial arch which actually ascends up and crosses this first dorsal interosseum and then merges with the you know this dorsal spedis artery talking about the comparing homology by which you know compare the upper and lower limbs we are comparing here so let's compare of the palm and soul in the palm you have 20 muscles right in the soul you 20 intrinsic muscles in the soul you have 18 intrinsic muscles so let me help you because you know upper limb and lower limb they are very much homologous if you have this fundamental idea in your mind of comparing between the homologous you will easily uh, you know get it uh, remember for a long time so here we divide 15 and 5 15 intrinsic muscles by another now five muscles are needed now which is the lateral which is supplying laterally right both cutaneous and muscular branches and ulnar arch on the medial side right so in the soul there are you know you have a medial plantar artery and a lateral plantar artery so compare now the lateral and medial plantar artery with ulnar and medial nerve in the palm so in the soul out of this 18 intrinsic muscles we will divide now as 14 and 4 you minus 1 from both so that becomes 14 and 4 14 intrinsic muscles in the soul will be innovated by which nerve lateral plantar nerve or medial plantar nerve compare the homology this is post axial border and in the soul the post axial border is the lateral border got it so and which nerve is running here on the post axial border is ulnar nerve. So ulnar nerve is homologous to lateral plantar nerve in the soul. Remember that. So ulnar nerve supplies 15 muscles, lateral plantar nerve supplies 14 muscles. Now median nerve, which is running on the post pre axial border, that's the lateral side, and median nerve supplies 5 muscles in the palm. And in the soul, you have median plantar nerve which is homologous to median nerve in the palm. So median plantar nerve will supply 4 muscles of the 18 muscles in the soul. Got it? So this way you can remember what the muscles are. Now about the cutaneous distribution. Now think about the cutaneous distribution. In the palm, remember, lateral, uh, you know, medial one third of the palm, medial one and a half digits, were being innovated by the skin here was innovated by ulnar nerve. The little two third of the palm, the little three and a half digits were innovated by median nerve. Got it? Remember the concept of medial and lateral here. Now think about the soul. Soul. Now it will be because this is pre axial water, and in the soul, the pre axial water is the medial border. So it will be medial two third of the soul, medial three and a half digits will be innervated by the nerve which is homologous to median nerve in the palm. So there will be, it will be median plantar nerve. Remember, median plantar nerve has a major cutaneous innervation in the soul, just like median nerve in the palm. Now. In the soul, the lateral one third of the soul and lateral one and a half toes, the skin will be innervated by lateral plantar nerve. Lateral border is same as post axial border. So, ulnar nerve in the hand is same as lateral plantar nerve in the soul. So, there is less of cutaneous innervation from the lateral plantar nerve, just like here in ulnar nerve. Got it now? Same in case of arterial arches. Superficial palmar arch supplies blood to the meal in the half digits. Similarly, in the soul, the plantar arterial arch, which is a continuation of you know this little plantar arch, little plantar artery. So everything on the you know ulnar uh, posterior artery, then lateral plantar artery, the same as ulnar artery and superficial palmar arch. So there, the plantar arterial arch supplies blood. To the lateral three and a half digits and the lateral two third of the soul. Same here in this case of superficial palm arch produces blood in the medial side, right? Medial to the palm, medial three and a half digits. 
so there will be lot of you know things to compare you just keep an idea about the pre axial border post axial border this is lateral here medial here sole mein this will be medial the pre axial border is medial and the post axial is lateral so things which are lateral in the upper limbs will be medial in the lower limbs things which are medial in the uh, upper limbs will be comparable to things in the lateral uh, side of the lower limbs got it i think this lecture is going more taking more of time so i should stop here we'll continue some other time okay